little pre-flight check. Let's see, we got master on, radio master good, everything else. Get some navs, a strobe, fuel is on, trim is set, flaps are set, and most important of all, As I fly from Oliver to Kelowna, following the chain of freshwater lakes and rivers, I can see the dryness of the landscape nestled amongst the rolling hills of the Columbia and Cascade mountain ranges. And we're just uh, 5,000 feet uh, over Okanagan Mountain Park uh, on the north side of it. Uh, Squawk at 1200, we're doing some aerial filming of the park area and uh, we'll be inbound for a full stop. Roger, Clone Alpha, 3005, we're landing runway 16, when you're inbound. Copy 16, and we'll advise inbound, and it's uh, Whiskey Hotel X-ray. Whiskey Hotel X-ray, 6. In the hot, dry summer of 2003, a lightning strike touched down in the Okanagan Valley and a spark was born. Before this spark lost its flame, it consumed over 25,000 hectares of forest and parkland, forced the evacuation of more than 27,000 people, and destroyed over 200 homes. For over two weeks, this inferno exhausted the efforts of over 2,500 firefighters loggers, and members of the Canadian Armed Forces as they waged war against the Okanagan Mountain Park firestorm. Right over my shoulder is Okanagan Mountain Park and we're in the town of Kelowna. Imagine looking up at that hill ablaze, especially with the wind that we feel this morning. It would add to the drama thinking it's going to get pushed right into town here. It would have been quite the spectacle. Rennie Blanley, the fire chief of the Kelowna Fire Department, has witnessed the overwhelming destructive nature of fire for many years. The 2003 firestorm struck Kelowna at a level even he had never witnessed before. Wildfires are something that we've dealt with ongoing over the history of Kelowna because it is semi-desert and it's dry and we do have seasonal fires. 2003 was certainly a lot drier and a lot more dangerous than most and we had experienced a lot of small grass fires and wildfires in Kelowna over that period as well. We certainly knew the potential was there. And it started out relatively small and, and obviously a very difficult area for us to access. Uh, not an area that we would readily have gone to uh, on most days. It certainly was a challenge. You could go by water. Uh, there was really no road system that would get you in close to it. Okanagan Mountain Park had been an area of concern for forestry and the provincial government for a long time. There was a lot of dry timber in there. There was a lot of dead fuel. We could see it from our house crawling right across the mountain um, on the other side of the lake. So it was uh, watching it, seeing it progress, and then actually sitting on our deck and seeing the first house go up. On the night of the 21st, uh, myself and Lou Wild and two forestry guys got up in a helicopter. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon, took a fly up, and it was quite something to see. It looked like Niagara Falls, but fire, wind-driven, moving at 11 kilometers an hour. I looked over and there's a 30-year forestry veteran beside me and, and his eyes were big and he said, you know what, I've, I've seen rank six fire in, in unurbanized areas, he said, but I've never seen it moving at this rate towards a populated city. You've got a city property. Yeah. And you've got a fire coming towards it. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to just put up a line and stop yeah. it. Tell, tell me what the frustration well, is. I that. can tell you, from a structural perspective, that's what we thought we could do. We thought we would go out in the perimeter of the area, and we, we knew this thing was moving into our area because it was in this kicking horse, wild horse canyon that was kind of down and kind of dropped into Crawford. And, and we put up a defense sort of on the edges of, of the property, of, uh, if you will, of the city of Kelowna and said, okay, we had hose lines hooked up to hydrants. We were foaming down areas, cutting down trees, setting up this defendable space, thinking, we'll stop it here, right, as a group collectively. And we had a lot of firefighters up there. Uh, we had a lot of engines, a lot of equipment up there. And um, 
In the early goings, the Ember brands were probably traveling five and six kilometers over their heads and starting some houses on fire, fully involved roofs, and our people were kind of up on the on the perimeter of the city, if you will, waiting for this fire, kind of sitting there going, well, we don't see anything. Well, do we have houses on fire behind them? I remember being at the grocery store and coming outside and it was raining ash, and it just looked like snow was falling, but it was ash and it was crazy. My dad was one of the firefighters in it, so it was, anxious like I was you know waiting for him to come home each night hoping that he was going to be okay. We try and work strategically obviously trying to save life as a priority and then obviously we want to make sure the safety of our own people is ensured um, and then we want to do the best we can to uh, save property. The structural people would look after the houses and 100 meters from the houses into the wildland area and the forestry people would look after the wildland fire and one of the big things was a unified command where the command was set up jointly with forestry and with structural firefighters and that way we had accountability, we knew where they were, they knew where we were, they knew what strategies and objectives so that we could meet the same end goal and that was to ultimately put out this large scale fire. You've got this fire that you're trying to, to deal with but the manager's worst nightmare is guys behind the line can't get out in danger. T tell me what that's like. Well, you know what? That's is, that, a, did, that's is that what you signed up for? That's a god-awful <laughs> feeling, to be honest with you. Yeah. And at the point where we can control and command our own staff, but when you start putting so many more responders and firefighters into the game, uh, and, the, and some of them you're not even aware that are out there, uh, you know, I, I told you that we had probably anywhere from six to 800 firefighters on scene here. Everybody's up there trying to get into the game and, and try and help out. Well, at that point now, your accountability and command board really uh, kind of flies out the window. and. Everybody's out there trying to do the right thing, but at the end of the day, everybody's got to come back as well. We have firefighters here that experience uh, some very scary situations and being trapped and caught behind the fire line, if you will. You know, you're up there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's like a campfire. You're sitting around there, it's a campfire, a lot of smoke and stuff, but it's a campfire. At 2 in the afternoon, it's nothing you can imagine. We had buses dropping off, you know, structural and forestry firefighters that had been up uh, on the hillside for 12 to 20 hours at a go. It looked like they were coming back from Vietnam. I mean, guys were emotionally drained. Um, they had s suffered the kind of losses that they'd never experienced before. Houses that, uh, doing the very best you can, having a hose line on it, you know, doing a very aggressive attack to seeing houses just simply go up in flames right in front of their eyes. You're watching a tree up the hillside just it's a ball of flame. It's a tree, now it's a ball of flame. You can't imagine a tree disappearing that fast. Rank 6 fire uh, sounded like a jet engine just rolling. Uh, very, just really awesome, ominous stuff to be part of and certainly uh, a lot of firefighters scared for their own safety that evening. Hellfire, hell night they called it. Pretty powerful stuff. DVD copies of the Wings Over Canada series are available singly or in box sets at wingsovercanada.ca or at 1-866-909-4647.